It is my tremendous pleasure to introduce Professor Cheryl Mattingly, who is professor in the departments of anthropology and philosophy at Aarhus, and also a professional for professor of anthropology emeritus at the University of Southern California. Her primary interests are in critical phenomenology, the anthropology of ethics, medical and psychological anthropology, as well as narrative, chronic illness, disability and health disparities, race and minority health. Her primary research has been in the United States, and she's been the recipient of untold numbers of awards and honors, including a doctorate in 2018 from Aarhus, uh, the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship from 2017 to 2018, uh, the Dale T. Mortensen Fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Aarhus. And her publication awards include the 2015 New Millennium Book Prize, for Moral Laboratories, the 2011 Sterling Book Prize for Paradi Paradox of Hope, and the 2000 Victor Turner Book Prize for Healing Dramas and Clinical Plots. Her most recent book is Imagistic Care, Growing Old in a Precarious World, which is co-edited with Langron. And today, Cheryl will be sharing with us some of her ideas around errant anthropology and errant phenomenology, which is very, very exciting. I'm going to turn over to her now and say welcome to all of you and thank you so much for coming, Cheryl. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and really, thank you for this invitation, Kelly, and also Judith as the important person who helps to make this happen. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to be part of a, this bold and important, into my mind, um, seminar series. And and I'm going to use it because, Kelly, you told me this was a good idea, so I'll blame you if it is not, but I'm going to use it as a place to try out some ideas which are still very much in progress. Um, okay, so uh, and and the so the the I'm going to show a PowerPoint slide, and I think you'll be able to see me somewhere in the corner. So you have a human uh, that goes with the slides. The talk is, Oh, approximately about 50 minutes. Um, I will um, I will um, really try to save time for the Q and A um, at the end. So um, let me just do the screen sharing uh, thing and okay and and. Kelly, can you see this? Um, I can. Okay. So um, the only thing is, oops, sorry, accidentally moving forward. Um, okay. So um, um, this title of my talk, um, Category Trouble, an Errant Phenomenology of Stigma and Care. So this this title is has been the working title of a book project that has taken me several years to develop and is still not complete. Um, what has emerged recently has become clear to me that I had two books instead of one, and I have um, invited two different co-authors to help me um, to help me with these books. And though I'm gonna talk with an I voice from the from the work that I've done that is now split in these two, I wanna just mention my two collaborators. One of them, Melissa Park, is I think um, here with us on Zoom. The book that Melissa and I are uh, writing now from this original Category Trouble Project is provisionally called The Method of Perplexity, Connecting in a Neurodiverse World. Melissa is a longtime co-thinker, a friend and colleague, a professor at McGill University who has been carrying out a host of innovative ethnographic and participatory research projects in neurodiverse communities. The second book, which actually bears the same title of this talk, the title of the original uh, one book, is uh, with Stephanie Keeney Parks. And it focuses especially upon stigma and the intersections of race and disability for African Americans. Stephanie comes to this as an insider, as we sometimes say, an anthropologist who is also an Amer African American mother of a teenage son with autism. And her research over the last decade has been with other African American women parenting children with autism. 
Okay, so and I'm going to draw in this talk from what turns into uh, uh, themes that that crop up in in both of these books. The broader issue that the books collectively address and try to puzzle through is this vexed problem of how do we think about marginalized social identity categories and the politics surrounding them without reducing people to victim status or to mere members of a collective. This, of course, is not a new problem. I have a feeling, I'm in fact quite certain, that many of you are also um, addressing this, thinking this through, and drawing upon various resources to do this. For me, this is not a purely academic exercise. I grew up in two biracial families, one Japanese American, the other Latinx, and my younger brother was born with a serious physical disability. My first husband of my early years was diagnosed as a child with ADHD and as an adolescent with bipolar disorder. What life in these, and we met as teenagers, so he's been a person uh, I've known for a long time. What life in these three families taught me was that the lived experience of kinship doesn't easily fit into society's dominant classifications of race or disability or gender and the like. However necessary and useful ethnicity and disability categories can be, and in fact, however essential for social justice politics, they never seem to catch the dense and subtle relationality that I shared with my siblings or a husband who rejected every mental health label assigned to him. I'm not ordinarily autobiographical in my talks or very much in my writing, but I've opened with these remarks because it increasingly seems important to me to at least gesture to my own social location in the kind of research I do. And now I'm actually going to turn to some ethnographic material based on a long-term study of African-American families raising children with significant illnesses and disabilities in Southern California. And I have written quite a lot about this, so uh, this is not a new research study. It, um, it was a large interdisciplinary team study. Melissa Park was involved with this uh, early on as well, and it began in the 1990s, uh, but with some of us still writing from what emerged from it. I can't tell you about all the ways that we uh, collected data, as we say. We interviewed parents, healthcare providers, sometimes teachers, children where we could. Uh, we also did a lot of videotaping of clinic, home, and community encounters and events and amassed a really enormous archive. Although this study officially ended after some 15, 17 years, officially ended a decade ago, several of us are still in contact with a number of the families, so we continue to have glimpses into how family life has changed over decades. Let's see, let me advance here. So I've been thinking of stigma as a kind of category trouble with four primary questions in mind. How do stigmatizing categories trouble people? How do people trouble or try to trouble those categories? And a third, almost like a different a meta level question, how might we scholars, we researchers, think about categories by disturbing category thinking itself? This is a key theme for this talk, and how do those that we study, collaborate with, write about, also try to disturb category thinking, and to what ends? Stigma is a very familiar subject, of course. Half a century ago, Irving Goffman famously described stigma as a situation of quote-unquote spoiled identity, a societally shaped identity relationally produced. Goffman foregrounds its interactional face, one, what one might call a shaming drama, but many other frameworks also speak to stigma, from Foucault's discursive approach to governmentality, his judges of normalcy, if you remember them, to the political economy of structural violence, to historical analyses of post-colonial regimes and anti-Black racism, the phenomenon of stigma sits squarely in the heartland of what Joel Robbins has called suffering subject anthropology. 
stigmatizing dramas are embedded in or afforded by material space and other scenic resources. Here, for example, is a classroom that my collaborator Stephanie provided because her son had been in a class like this. Teachers have referred, if you see the box kind of in the middle of this class, um, teachers refer to this design as a classroom within a classroom or a timeout room for children who become disruptive. You might also think of this as a prison which functions as a spectacle. The incarcerated child is both out of sight of classmates and hyper visible in their invisibility. That's more or less how Stephanie saw it. I might add that this picture looks much more threatening to American audiences I've discovered than to, for example, some Danish ones where I've showed it, underscoring the culturally specific face of stigma's relational status. So I want to introduce to you um, Malcolm and his mother, Autumn. Malcolm is the African-American child in the middle of this uh, a screenshot from a videotape that's now like about 20 years old. And this is when he was about uh, six years old. I want to, um, I want to um, offer you a story that Autumn tells uh, in a parent group meeting when Malcolm was just this age um, about his struggles of, of being part of the school world. And um, this, this parent group meeting was part of uh, another thing we did is, is in this big uh, grant where we organized regular meetings of parents who wanted to join, um, to come together a few times a year. And uh, we, we named these family advisory groups, uh, but they really became sort of um, narrative groups. People came in to tell stories about what was happening to them. We asked them for advice about what we were seeing. Um, and um, in this particular uh, parent group, Autumn is telling a story about a recent problematic encounter just uh, at her son's school, just when he is about this age. And another mother, Tanya, whose child has cerebral palsy, chimes in. So I've given you um, a little bit of the dialogue so you can see it there as well. So Autumn says, Part of the problem is also, I think, that they look at children of color when they have disabilities, that it's more, oh no, you know, they can't be helped kind of thing. Tanya nods, Autumn. And I ran into that this summer and I was just like sort of blindsided, ran into that at summer school. So she goes on, I was, I was there talking to the teacher individually and Malcolm was off playing and he would do something, you know, that he wasn't supposed to be doing. And I would say, she makes her voice soft, okay, you need to get that cleaned up. And right behind me, the teachers, Autumn shifts her tone, becoming annoyed and urgent. Okay, you need to get that cleaned up. Tanya, they automatically attach a label to the child. Autumn agrees. Tanya, or they say, okay, well, I've gotten this too. Well, what did you, did you take drugs when you were, the entire group of parents <laughs> responds, oh my goodness. And they begin to laugh. Autumn, it's like, don't even take me there. Tanya, already a negative, negative. Autumn overlapping. And then they label, like I said, they label your child and they're very quick to say, First of all, he's an African-American child, so therefore they're more aggressive anyhow, you know, and along those lines. When the whole group responds to Tanya's remarks, they are not, vo the, the group of parents, they are not voicing surprise or shock so much as recognition. Tanya doesn't even need to mention that this drug accusation is a pregnancy story. They already know where this is going. They're familiar with it. There are some, there are many powerful critical theories that can help illuminate the stigma that Malcolm and Autumn face. While not in any way dismissing these theories, I want to raise the following question. In our powerful explanations, in our powerful data, do we already know what we are seeing? Do we see with too much certainty? For example, that to an American audience chilling photo of the classroom prison. A key problem, or so it appears to me, is that we know 
too much about how stigma works interactionally and systemically. How might certainties be deserved, disturbed so that we can think anew about a familiar concept like this? So defrosting is a metaphor I borrow from Hannah Arendt, who in a series of essays pondered the problem that dominant political and ethical concepts freeze when they become canonical. This prevents us from thinking about what they point to in new ways. In fact, they can become obstacles to thinking at all. She suggests that the only way to address this problem is not merely through inventing better or Im more improved concepts, because after all, they too will freeze if they become orthodox. Rather, there must be something she suggests about the experience of thinking itself that can be protective and productive. In fact, she says, this is just what thinking is, an experience of defrosting. Or, so she's offering us a phenomenological proposal because she presumes that experience has the capacity to instigate critical reflection and disorientation of our most authoritative or taken for granted concepts. And I'm gonna to return to the phenomenology um, influence here in a minute. But this is quite a radical proposal and I've really, um, I've really been provoked by it. Arendt turns to um, Socrates and his questioning methods as an exemplar of defrosting, his gadfly uh, operation, as he called himself. But I turn to ethnography and its capacity to puzzle about even the most authoritative concepts in critical theories arsenal by putting them in conversation with ethnographic particulars that destabilize them. This ethnographic method of perplexity, as I started calling it, um, is not simply about situations when the ethnographer becomes perplexed, as we often do in our research, but also situations in which our interlocutors find themselves perplexed when their own common sense assumptions or categories are thrown into doubt. And I'm going to illustrate with um, a, a very short story from one of um, Malcolm's therapy sessions, an early session with a speech therapist. So just around the time that Malcolm had the problematic experience with the teacher that Autumn describes, he also began speech therapy. His referral from the school psychologist placed him in the category of what was then called low functioning autism. And the, 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 the interlude I'm going to um, talk, recount to you happened during his second session. So this is a new therapist. She doesn't really know Malcolm and he doesn't know her. Um, at the start of the session, he's restless and fidgety. Sometimes he tries to make a break for it and escape through the door that leads back to the waiting room where his mother is, is sitting. Pampa also shows increasing frustration uh, to match some of his frustration. She tries to calm him down and get him to focus. Even when he's not attempting to escape, he appears disengaged with the task she sets for him. Then, um, um, and, and Pampa uses I don't know what a British equivalent would be, be for this, but a kind of picture holder, a viewfinder, uh, we used to call it. And in this viewfinder, there are a series of pictures and she asks part of the task, the therapy task is to uh, have him tell her uh, who's in the picture. When he looks at these pictures and they start very simply, a boy, a girl, a dog, uh, and with very simple words, um, he stumbles over the words. He repeats her um, in ways that seem merely mechanical, like she'll say, well, who's that? And he doesn't say very much or he stutters and she'll say, well, is that a boy? And then he says, a boy, or is that a dog? A dog, he'll say. He, has, he seems to have trouble identifying familiar objects on the cards and his performance lends support to this diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder with significant intellectual impairment. But then it so happens that the next picture in this viewfinder series is a picture of a dinosaur. When that comes into view, everything changes. So Pampa saying, you ready? Holding it up for him to look in the viewfinder. 
What's that, Malcolm, she asks. Dinosaur, he says. Pampa, dinosaur? There's two of them, she adds. And for the first time in the entire session, Malcolm is focused and attentive. His whole body shifts, becoming alert and still. He asks eagerly for the picture of the viewer so he can see more. So look at that. So this carries on in this way. Look at that. What is it? She asks. Malcolm. Allosaurus. Tampa. Shocked. Let me see. She goes on. Whoa, I get scared. There's a big brown dinosaur in there. What else do you see? A new picture. A stegosaurus, he says. Tampa, a stegosaurus. Let me see for real. Wow, you're right. You have to actually look at the cards to see what kind of dinosaur this is. It is a stegosaurus. What else do you see? Next picture, triceratops. Pampa, wow, you do know your dinosaurs. You're right. That is a triceratops. They continue in this manner for a few more minutes with Malcolm identifying dinosaurs one by one as Pampa quizzes him. She often has to uh, ask several times to get the picture viewer back because he is so entranced by the dinosaurs that come into view. She's stunned by his responses. After, after he has effortlessly identified and pronounced Tyrannosaurus rex, Pampa asks him, how do you know this? In her surprise, she breaks the frame and speaks to the uh, researcher behind the camera, which she has uh, otherwise ignored. She says, astonished, oh my God, he can't say like a three syllable word, but he can say this, wow. And then to Malcolm, you blow my mind, Malcolm. Can I see a further aside to the videographer? He was right on all of them. What has been defrosted at least momentarily in this encounter? Certainly this category of low functioning autism, but we might also say in a phenomenological vein, Pampa's clinical common sense. Okay, so uh, the errant phenomenology, I've given you this strange title in my a title of my talk that I'm proposing builds upon this ethnographic um, series of surprises, um, but also is informed by multiple lines of scholarship, including scholars in the black radical tradition. And I wanna say a bit more about that now. My approach to defrosting, which foregrounds ethnography's perplexing particulars, is perhaps closer to Glissant, the, uh, the scholar contemporary of Fanon who advocates uh, from Martinique, who advocates an opaque and errant kind of thinking, one that resists what he calls transparencies. Glissant takes transparency to be the enemy of thought because it presumes to show clearly what cannot be settled. He advocates instead a thick, opaque experience of the world. Opacity is not the same as obscurity, he tells us. Rather, it recognizes, quote, that which cannot be reduced, end quote, and it puts thinking at risk. And Glissant is particularly concerned with social identity opacity. Uh, so that is important for my purposes. Glissant speaks of the errantry of thought. Now, errantry is not an everyday word. It can be traced to two Latin sources that encompass traveling of a wandering, roving sort and erring, erring. As error, errantry means behaving wrongly, straying outside the proper boundaries. By medieval times, errantry also referred to a quest, even a noble quest, a meaning that Glissant is also alert to. Glissant thinks with big history, not like my little uh, scenes. He thinks with the archetype of the Middle Passage through which Africans were brought to the Americas, arguing that errantry and other practices, fugitivity, creolization, were responses to the collapse of a world for these new world black people. The enslaved ran away uh, or hiding as fugitives. Their escapes were of course errors by colonial standards, punishable by death, but also a mode of traveling, traveling in error, a quest to live differently. Errantry, as Glisson develops this concept, directs us to the appearance of natality. I'm not going to do a little detour into Arendt, but I have found Arendt and Glisson very interesting to think together with, and she 
also um, thinks about natality or second birth. Glisson offers an image of the womb abyss by which he refers to the ship's hold where slaves were kept or even the sea itself where they were sometimes thrown overboard. And also the potentiality of a creolized cultural birth in the midst of this devastating world destroying violence. Fred Moten, um, a contemporary black scholar brings, uh, American black scholar, brings Glissant's concepts of errantry, fugitivity, and opacity into contemporary Black life, including everyday domestic scenes. Moten particularly attends to Black response that is not political in the usual way performed in a public sphere, as resistance, for example. This kind of response often goes unregistered, at least in public discourse, because it does not manifest in this overt and collective way. But yet it is here, he says, that we find in more routine and everyday ways, the black experience of prefiguring another world in this one. And so I've been thinking with what Bell Hooks, another uh, uh, scholar, you might know her work, talks about as home space, the domestic spaces of African-American families where other worlds could uh, could at least momentarily or in that space arise and other identities. I've been drawn to the work of um, Moten and Glissant because my study has been among parents and grandparents who were rarely explicitly activist, but they were responding to structural violence and stigma, often in inventive, even culture creating ways. And these culture creating ways of responding were often hidden from view of dominant institutions like clinics and schools, and I think under theorized um, in our in our um, in our own uh, theoretical discourse. So while I've said something about the errant feature of errant phenomenology, I want to also take a moment to locate it more clearly. I'm not sure I'm going to be successful at this within phenomenology, especially recent work in critical phenomenology. And I don't know, I'm just apologizing for the next slide, which is a sort of ridiculously um, truncated cursory phenomenology lecture 101 um, section. There are, um, and we can talk about it in the Q&A, there are a number of anthropologists who have been Jason Troop, Jared Ziggin, Bernhard Leisler, um, who have been writing about uh, critical phenomenology in um, the anthropological context. But I'm just going to give you this uh, ridiculous run through. So, all right, initiated by the philosopher Husserl in the early decades of the 20th century, phenomenology was inherently critical because it posed challenges to the usual perceptual orientations and concepts um, in, uh, that Husserl called the natural attitude. From its inception, phenomenology was concerned to bring to conscious reflection, to denaturalize not only ordinary tacit common sense, but also the most widely revered scholarly ideals of knowledge and truth. It has long challenged traditional metaphysics and claims of objectivity inspired by the uh, natural sciences, for example. If there's one thing that phenomenology is primed to illuminate, it's the uncertainties, alterities, and uncanniness of lived experience. It um, demonstrates how close attention to experience has the potential to throw our own categories of knowing, our own conceptual certainties into question. In philosophy and anthropology, what is now called critical phenomenology is one outgrowth of this original project. Most significantly, rather, and this is a really vital and interesting uh, interdisciplinary field, I think, right now. Most significantly, rather than focusing mm -hmm. primarily on transcendental, that is, universal features of experience, which was the hallmark of classic phenomenology, critical phenomenology foregrounds what philosopher Lisa Gunther calls quasi-transcendentals. These are historical realities which come to take on the quality of naturalness, functioning as, as, as though they were transcendentals of a biological or existential kind. 
although arising and forming within particular social uh, life worlds. Social categories like race, gender, and disability often operate in this way. And it's not hard to see that with this um, philosophical work in critical phenomenology, we find philosophers who come much closer to an anthropological kind of mindset. So critical phenomenology is explicitly directed to disturbing dominant society's commonly held perceptions, its natural attitude surrounding these quasi-transcendentals, exposing their entwinement with structures of oppression and practices of marginalization. It focuses on the oppressive forces of power as these are lived, shaping life worlds, horizons of perception and bodily senses. While um, there's a lot of exciting recent work, especially among feminist uh, philosophers in critical phenomenology, as well as a lot of us in anthropology, um, there's a longer history to this, most notably the writings of Simone de Beauvoir and Frantz Fanon. Critical phenomenology is doubly critical because it not only continues to use close description and investigation of experience to critique common sense categories of perception, but because it also directs attention to structural critique and structural, I mean, sorry, structural injustices as uh, in many other dominant um, uh, genres of critical social theory. And notably, particularly in philosophy, this is done through rethinking and amending and critiquing the work of classic phenomenologists. In my proposed errant phenomenology, I also introduce a third critical dimension. By directing attention, not only to critique of social structure, um, but to how marginalized people express critique in creative or even wayward responses to injustice or marginalization. I explore errantry ethnographically as a small scale practice of world repair, a, hoeti a poetics of habitation and relation. Um, and I call upon this concept, which obviously I have taken from Glissant, um, to consider how people make a way out of no way as the African-American saying goes, and as Autumn tries to do for her son. Structural critique in the usual sense is part of this response um, to uh, stigma and other um, marginalizing practices, as we, as we just heard from Autumn in her challenge of a teacher. But so too are moments when a different world, a different space of possibility reveals itself. And so to, and this is kind of the focus of, of, uh, of this errant critical phenomenology, Another way of thinking about it, if you remember Raymond Williams, is to think about this as affirmative critique, not just fault finding, um, but, uh, but, but uh, recognizing a potentiality in everyday experience. Okay, so I'm going to um, uh, now tell you another story uh, to take some of these abstractions and place them in ethnographic context, anthropologist that I am. Um, and this is um, this is a, another uh, visit to the world of Autumn and Malcolm, and this time it's um, Autumn's house. Again, I'm, I'm locating everything for purposes of this talk around the age when Malcolm was about six. On this visit, Jasmine, one of the team researchers, went to see them video camera in hand. Upon arrival, Malcolm was eager to show his bedroom a prehistoric wonderland upon which there were shelves and shelves of dinosaurs, plastic ones, soft fabric ones who could be cuddled at night, dangerous ones showing their sharp teeth. This world materialized not only in Malcolm's many dinosaurs, but in his three treasured dinosaur movies that he watched again and again. This bedroom, a space secluded from public view, from the world of school, for example, a fugitive space, one might say, is a place in which another Malcolm emerges than the one that we see in these other domains. And so I'm going to um, give you a little snippet of the conversation that unfolds in that, um, in that uh, visit that, that, that we pay to Autumn's house. So, um, 
Malcolm declares more than once, I am a fossil. And I'm going to sort of give you a sense of how that happens. So Jasmine, a young, one of the younger researchers on the team, is dutifully trying to interview Autumn about Malcolm's development and things that have been going on at school and at home um, while uh, bringing her video camera and videotaping at the same time. Um, but um, ja Malcolm's not having it. He begins jumping up and down on his bed and crying out, fossil, then a bit louder. I'm a fossil. At the maybe second or third attempt on Malcolm's part to insert himself, Autumn turns to her. You're a fossil, she says. Jasmine tries to continue Autumn, but Autumn pays increasing attention to Malcolm. And at this invitation by his mother into the conversation, he gets off the bed, slithers on the ground in the manner of a large lizard, and makes his way to Jasmine, opening his mouth wide, roaring, and pretending to bite her feet. Oh no, Jasmine says. Ouchie, ouchie. As Malcolm watches entranced, okay, no, I have to uh, tell you something else uh, here first. I just want to um, pause for a minute to notice how Autumn is responding to these interruptions by Malcolm. She does not reprimand him as American parents usually would, at least maybe not anymore, but at least uh, they used to. And often um, parents did inter uh, interrupt children or um, chastise children who interrupt during our home interviews. Instead, she gives him some subtle encouragement. And in fact, he finally derails the entire adult conversation and she allows him to uh, put on his favorite film, which is about an allosaurus called Big Al. Big Al is an animation based on a paleontological discovery of a dinosaur who lived a very terrible life. And the terribleness of this life is, is, is animated uh, uh, in, the, in the movie. He is injured and partly disabled when trying to mate with a female as an adolescent, according to the animated story. Um, he can no longer hunt for food and he dies alone when a long drought arrives. As Malcolm watches entranced, he identifies every dinosaur that comes into view, flawlessly naming them all. When a fierce apatosaurus stomps across the stream, Screen, he pauses his jumping, which he had resumed at some point. Whoa, he says, odd. So when Malcolm declares himself to be a fossil, what kind of eye is he invoking? What kind of subject position is this? On the one hand, what I've just described might seem to be the epitome of an ordinary encounter with a child Malcolm's age. And yet, if we situate Malcolm's enchantment with Big Al in a stigmatizing world, where race, disability, and gender meet, something else becomes visible. As a fossil come to life, one who slithers and bites, Malcolm's touch solicits human contact and connection. He creates a joyful moving image, both like and unlike Big Al. In a moment with his mother and a researcher he barely knows, embracing an identity across living and dead, the human and non-human, he becomes not just any fossil, but the remains of an injured, lonely, prematurely dying dinosaur. In that moment, he displays competencies that are rarely visible elsewhere. I could find some theories to explain this exchange, of course. Um, and in fact, I tried to develop an errant phenomenology to handle it. But for at least the moment, I want to follow a method of perplexity by hesitating by dwelling with the strangeness of this exchange, by amplifying its strangeness, its opacity, the alterity of Malcolm in this moment as a kind of hybrid Malcolm Big Al. In Malcolm's school world, we know he is routinely stigmatized. Teachers pronounce him aggressive. He cannot easily make friends. Why doesn't anyone like me? He sometimes asks his mother crying when she picks him up after school. 
Vigal's fate offers an uncanny premonition of his own future during his adolescent years, where his loneliness and ostracism intensifies. The last time I saw Malcolm in person, he was 17. He kept his arms rigidly to his sides, still as a statue, frowning even when I approached him with a smile. He had learned too many harsh lessons over the years as his friendly overtures to, for example, greet strangers at a bus stop were met with fear. And as his mother counseled him that it was dangerous for him to do that. So when he was young, he might greet others with an, with an exuberant hug as he did um, me, a cheerful body slam. But as he grew older, hugs, especially to female classmates, classmates were not only disdained, but perceived by school staff as sexual aggression. And yet, something of the young Malcolm was still present, lived in new ways. In one of our family meetings, um, this was when he was maybe um, 14 or 15. Um, for example, we gave him pens and paper to try to keep him entertained in another room uh, during the family group session. After the meeting, we discovered that he had filled page upon page with intricately detailed sketches of Robotox, Robotox avatars in various imaginal scenes. A year ago, when he was nearly 25, I heard from his mother that he was in college, though struggling to finish. Ah, uh, never mind. I won't. This is the final desperate uh, scene in the movie of uh, the uh, dead uh, Allosaurus. Stigma is a concept that belongs to conclusion. Stigma is a concept that belongs to an arsenal of important contributions to critical social theory. I want to conclude here with a word about critique, for critical theory looks different in the way that I'm trying to envision it and with my examples than I think it often does. For Autumn, it's not just about what goes wrong, though she certainly is very willing um, to denounce society's racism um, as, as, and even to resist some of the disability labels uh, which have attached themselves to um, Malcolm, particularly autism, because she says, when people hear that word, they think they know her son, and yet they don't. A critique, in addition to this more familiar version of critical, uh, of a critical manifestation, also appears as a kind of fugitive creativity, a different mode of living together, as Fred Moten says. Malcolm's bedroom becomes a miniature social imaginary, an errant home space where alternative social identities can be played with, born, studied. Malcolm and his mother, these two poets of home life, using the resources at their disposal, create a realm which Malcolm, in which Malcolm is not governed by the same choices he faces in his public worlds. His actions are not restricted to a binary of either compliance or punishable resistance to institutional rules and norms, including how to be a good child around adults at home. An entirely other form of intersubjectivity operating by different codes at least momentarily comes into existence. Concepts look a little different here too. Instead of abstractions that generalize from particulars, the concept work taking place in Malcolm's bedroom weds an imagistic particular, this hybrid uh, uh, being uh, that Malcolm becomes, with something more abstract. The I that Malcolm declares himself to be in this encounter is not a social identity in the way that concept is ordinarily deployed as a category of persons. Rather, his declara declaration invokes an image concept, an unstable and paradoxical one at that. We could say that Autumn and Malcolm are cultivating perplexity as they embrace, embrace the boy who is a fossil. All right, I want to just say what I'm um, trying to do with these uh, ethnographic particulars. Um, in one sense, I'm not doing anything very new here. We are already, um, of course, 
familiar with anthropological, anthropology's long project of destabilizing authoritative concepts with our ethnographic particulars. And although I think this is especially the case with imagistic or more poetically inclined work, which often has this explicit aim of disturbing anthropology's own settled truths, we can also see it in virtually every version of anthropological work. But like any other research practice, ethnographic field work need not unsettle anything. It can simply reproduce taken for granted ways of seeing and knowing. And I think this is particularly has been a struggle for some of us working in this suffering subject domain. This is where developing a critical phenomenology has something crucial to offer, I think, including, I hope, the errant version that I'm putting forward. Okay, I'm about to open this. Um, right, I'm not telling you what happened to stigma. I hope you could kind of follow how I was trying to refigure stigma through this disorientation. Um, and, okay, <laughs> so it's kind of an advertisement, I guess. But uh, since I'm working with um, um, two book publications that aren't yet out yet, I thought I would at least um, mention some uh, recently published work, which uh, builds upon this errant uh, phenomenology or gestures toward it in various ways. Uh, and these are all, except for one, um, these are all in anthropology um, uh, books or uh, in journals. Uh, the, the one that isn't is in a journal of critical phenomenology, which is a feminist uh, philosophy journal uh, that uh, had a special issue, which Jared Ziggin and Joel, uh, not Joel Robbins and Jason Troop uh, co-edited, and also as a piece by Judith Butler. So, um, okay, I'm uh, stopping there, and I'm going to get out of this uh, screen sharing so that we can uh, we can actually have some time for questions. Cheryl, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh